comment on arbitration. In the late mid to late 90s, early 2000s, you would see binding arbitration in almost every contract. You still see them in a lot of contracts, particularly in the financial services industry. Under FINRA, it's, you know, it's, it's mandated. Um, is it always a good thing? Does anybody know what arbitration is about? How it works? You ever been through an arbitration before? So it's sort of uh, quasi litigation. It's not litigation. And what that means is if you get involved in arbitration, there's a mechanism to choose an arbitrator, a person who is going to handle the, like a judge, who's going to listen to both sides of the case. The rules of evidence may or may not apply depending on which rules of arbitration you fall under. And there are very detailed rules under each uh, jurisdiction as to how arbitration is to be conducted. But usually <laughs> arbitrators have broad leeway in what they can listen to as evidence and what they refuse to listen to as evidence. It's not like a court where there are rules of evidence that apply. And so the arbitrator can hear stuff that you otherwise would never hear and entertain ideas that never were entertained. That can be good, that can be bad. It also depends on who your lawyers are and how sophisticated they are and how sneaky they are and how subversive they are and how difficult they can be. Arbitration can be extremely contentious. You can have one arbitrator, you can have three arbitrators. It costs a lot of money to go through arbitration, but a lot less than going through litigation because what you typically avoid is the whole concept of discovery. Discovery is having to produce documents to the other side when they request it. Having to make available people for depositions to testify outside of court in a conference room with lawyers and a court reporter and other techniques that are used to gather information before you go to trial. Well, in an arbitration, you can put whatever you want in. So it could be unfair to one side and it may not get the whole story out. And an arbitrator's findings can be totally arbitrary. So arbitration doesn't always work well. And we have uh, litigators here who conduct arbitration. We have probably 20, now we have 22 litigators at this firm. Um, and to a person, they tell me arbitration is not preferred, not because they like to litigate, it's just because they've seen arbitrations go really, really bad. And in a litigation setting, you at least have rules that you have to follow. And if you don't follow them, if the attorney doesn't follow the rules in litigation, it's not like TV or the movies, they can be sanctioned. They can lose their license to practice. We've seen all kinds of stuff. So the best solution is get a business coach or business facilitator. An alternative solution, mediate if you can't resolve the issue and you can't do a buyout because the parties won't agree to it. Arbitration may or may not work. Litigation may be the only source of relief for the parties. Usually litigation, the only people who win are the lawyers, in my opinion. You should always try to settle, settle the case. And that's what our lawyers try to do, actually, at this firm. It's, it's a uniform way of practicing. It's a gentleman or gentlewoman's way of practicing. Um, that's our goal here at this firm. But we do have a lot of trial litigators who are very successful. What happens when you have minority shareholders? You can handle minority shareholders, again, by having a shareholders agreement that specifies exactly what happens if the minority shareholder, who may be an employee, leaves the company. We get to buy back your shares. And here's how the buyback works. And usually we represent the majority owner, but I've re represented a bunch of minority owners over the years too. So I know both sides of the coin, and I know the arguments on both sides. And the question is, what protections should you provide for your client? your client's the minority shareholder, we'll talk about a couple of them. If your client is the majority shareholder of the company, you need to protect the company from ridiculous demands of minority shareholders that may go out and hire expensive lawyers to try to scare you into settling into something that otherwise wouldn't be required. What do I mean by protection from oppression? Well, minority shareholders are just that. The majority technically can do whatever they want, right? 
but they can't just take all the money out of the business to the detriment of the minority shareholder consistently. They can't pay themselves at all out in compensation always to the detriment of a minority shareholder because the minority shareholder may say, hey, you're oppressing my rights. And as such, I'm going to take you to court and I may have a claim for unreasonable compensation that you're paying yourself. Or uh, taking corporate opportunities that really belong to the company of which I am a minority shareholder. And the minority shareholders have rights under all state laws. They have the right to inspect books and records, the business, see the financial statements. So the question is, what are your alternatives? Well, first, let's study a case study that is a real life example of one that I had to deal with, oh, 10 years ago to this, to this year. It started 10 years ago, but it actually started 13 or 14 years ago. This is a client I've represented since 2000. And they are a very successful company in Montgomery County. Uh, grew from zero, they were probably at 40 million, 45 million in revenue this year, all organically grown. And the founder owns today about 95% of the stock. But at the time, when he started up the company, he had a partner that he went into business with who he knew. And he said, look, this is my idea. I'm putting most of my, my capital at risk. Um, I want to run the company, but I'll bring you in as a partner. 30%, give you 30%. And this was in 1997 when this happened. And they started the company. The company started to grow. Seven years in, six years in, I, I get involved, more involved in the operations of the business. And, I find that there's this minority shareholder. He's not on the books and records anybody, but he, anywhere, but he's been promised 30% of the business. There's no shareholders agreement, there's nothing. I said, what did you do to document this? Well, I get, here's the email I sent to him in 1997. I said, good Lord, we need to do something about this. So let's try to structure a shareholders agreement today. So what we did was we structured a shareholders agreement. He hired a lawyer. Fortunately, he was a good transactional lawyer, and we hammered out a shareholders agreement that gave the minority shareholder some rights and gave the majority shareholder a lot of rights. But the minority shareholder's rights sort of would be trumped by the majority shareholder because we always wanted the right, as the majority shareholder, to terminate this guy from employment if they ever disagreed about stuff. Now, we created a whole section in the agreement about termination from employment. And there was termination with cause, which was very narrowly defined in this instance. It did something really, really bad to harm the company. And then there was termination without cause. And if we terminated him without cause, his lawyer wisely negotiated a right in the agreement that would require us to buy his shares out for some agreed upon value. The value was either what they agreed to or an appraisal process that we built into the shareholders. But if he was able to put his shares back to us, in other words, we had to buy his shares if we terminated without cause, then we would buy it at a deep discount. I mean, we would buy it at full fair market value, rather. Right? But if he resigned from employment, if he resigned from employment, we would buy it at a deep discount. One day in 2007, January 12th, thereabouts, <laughs> the 30% guy walked into the CEO of the company and said, you know what? You're doing a lousy job of running this company. People are unhappy. I'm in charge of the sales of the company. He's this big bravado guy. Love to jump out of airplanes and stuff like that. He said, I, I should be the CEO of the company. You should resign. And the CEO just kept quiet because he's that kind of guy. He just said, OK, so what is it that you want? <clears throat> I want you to resign. I want to become the CEO of the company. And you need to step aside because this company is not working properly. The company had been growing. 
maybe not as fast as the sales guy wanted it because he wanted more and more and more. CEO said, let me think about it. Let's talk on Monday. This was a Friday. I immediately got a phone call. He calls me up and says, what do I do? He said, well, let's look at the shareholders. Oh, well, if you fire him, you've got to buy him out for fair market value, and you've got to pay him faster than you otherwise would have to pay him. But if he resigns, we don't have to pay him full fair market value. We can discount it, and we can pay it out over a longer period of time. How do I get him to resign? <laughs> so the whole weekend we spent trying to figure out how to do this. So on Monday, I had him meet by with with his other chief lieutenant, <coughs> and he came in. The guy came in. The thirty percenter came in, and the CEO said, "Well, what did you say to me on Friday?" said, if you don't appoint me the CEO, I quit. I accept your resignation. Pack your things together. What do you mean? I didn't quit. I said, I don't accept the offer. You are not going to be the CEO of the company. So you said, if I don't make you CEO, then you quit. So you have quit. Uh, I'm not quitting. <laughs> You just did. <laughs> Left. We ended up in litigation, obviously. Right? It wasn't that clear. <laughs> but it was pretty clear. We ended up in litigation. The guy went off the handle. He was accusing our, my client of all kinds of uh, malfunctions, misfeasance, you know, everything. Didn't. None of it stuck. There was nothing true. In fact, I don't know how he got the litigator to write the pleadings, and sometimes these litigators are sharks in, you know, in the water, and they're looking just for blood anywhere, and they'll do anything. And that's unethical to me. That's not the way you operate as a lawyer. But this guy did. Then he fired one lawyer, hired another one because he didn't do exactly what he wanted him to do. And then he was on his third lawyer by the time we went into settlement negotiations. And we finally got a mediator, and. We spent the entire day mediating, but we reached an agreement at the end of the day as to what we would buy this clown out for. <laughs> and you know, in hindsight, we paid him a pittance compared to what the company is worth today. So he got out, I think we paid him like $1.4 million over a period of time. The company's probably worth $35 million today. His interest would have been worth close to 10, over $10 million should be and we're growing this company it's going it's going to hit 100 million in the next few years then we'll sell it and he won't get it done 